given what's happening here inside the Beltway, back home in the state houses, but also, and I will emphasize most importantly, in your communities and the opportunities we have to be advocates in every sense of the word. And I'm joined by an esteemed and wonderful panel that we are thrilled and proud to bring before you. Our policy team colleagues, uh, Nicole, that you've met today, and Melissa. Also, Paige Winfield Cunningham from the Washington Post, who we rely on every morning on our policy team. She is what wakes us up in the morning with her health um, 202 newsletter that comes into our inboxes and tell us everything we need to know. <laughs> so thank you, Paige. She gets up really early and stays up really night, really late at night um, to get that to us. And all the biography information formally is in your booklets. And then Becky Shipp on my far left, who is a former finance committee staffer for multiple, multiple years, though she'd be very young, uh, who is now working with us through the Sheridan Group and you'll be hearing from her colleague Tom Sheridan tomorrow night, author of a new book. So we have a whole lot of wealth of experience and breadth of experience in this panel to hit on some of the hot topics uh, in the policy world around costs of care. They're not all necessarily things that we're prioritizing in terms of our advocacy, but we see them as vehicles for conversations where we can put in the segue that's great that you're doing this around drug pricing, but have you thought about what it all means for people as opposed to health professionals or health systems? We can make a segue out of anything. We've already heard that today from your stories. Um, so you can always reorient toward what matters to us in the context of person-centered care. And this panel is to really highlight, all right, here's what's buzzing, and how can we think about segueing back to what the priorities are for the patients and families that we serve, advocate for, or are experiencing every day. So we're going to start with each giving some remarks up front about the areas that they cover and the issues that are hot and some advice for us. And then I'll ask a couple of questions and then we want mostly to hear from you your questions for the panel so that we can close out the day with you getting your burning issues uh, said out loud and answered. So we'll start with Nicole, who covers our, uh, our access to care portfolio and policy, which is huge. And she can talk a little bit about what's the buzz, uh, how we're handling it, and what we should all be thinking about. Thank you, Rebecca. So uh, bef behind me, you see our 2019 policy priorities one pager that is on our website. It's in your booklets. And we also shared this again during the webinar, uh, the policy webinar last week as a prerequisite to this discussion. But we will reiterate um, and answer any other questions you may have. So um, our policy priorities focus is across four main areas with the overall goal of advancing person-centered care and ensuring equitable access to affordable quality care. So as you can see, the equity bucket has covers issues such as uh, protecting and expanding Medicaid and safety net resources, um, as well as the access bucket, which is, uh, as Rebecca alluded to, is kind of a huge portfolio, but covers insurance protections and uh, policies put forth by insurance companies that can sometimes place barriers between people and the medications or treatments that they need. Um, then we have the affordability bucket, which really hits on our whole theme for this patient congress in terms of cost of care. Um, and then final, so that's all about lowering healthcare costs across the board, but mostly out-of-pocket costs for people and ac accounting for the trade-offs that people have to make between costs of medications and treatments versus household material hardships and other uh, household expenses. Um, and then finally, in our quality bucket, that really hits on quality of life, so issues that we cover such as palliative care um, and caregiving, which um, we alluded to a little bit earlier, but um, again, as Rebecca said, the focus for today's discussion is on these three um, hot topics. 
So if you tune into the news, if you've been reading um, the Post or any of the other newsletters out there um, to get news about health policy and what's going on in healthcare, you'll know that especially this year, healthcare is a top concern for lawmakers, both at the federal and the state level and in local communities. Um, and really, the focus is on three main areas. So we are thrilled and excited that there is bipartisan support and conversations all throughout um, federal lawmakers' offices about costs of care. So really, what we're talking about here is one bucket of coverage protections. Um, the next is drug pricing, which has been a super hot topic for quite a number of years, but it's really coming to a head this year. Um, and then also we have a surprise medical billing, which many of the patient stories that have been raised, um, and as Melissa shared her example, have really raised, um, created a heightened awareness around total costs of care. So of course, we know medications that you pick up at the pharmacy counter can be costly and out-of-pocket costs for that um, sometimes have to be um, shouldered by um, making trade-offs. But at the same time, what about when you go to the hospital? What costs might you encounter there? Um, so Melissa's example about an anesthesiologist is important because that's um, at the end of the day, if you get a bill from the hospital or a clinic because someone was out of network, the provider was out of, uh, the clinician was out of network versus the facility, you start to see costs add up and they often come to a surprise to many of us. Um, so I'll just briefly touch on the coverage protections bucket and drug pricing. Um, so when we talk about coverage protections, we're referring to anything, any. Um, patient protections or guardrails that exist to make sure that all people can get the health care that they need and are not discriminated against because of pre-existing conditions or really any serious chronic illness. So um, the Affordable Care Act, um, the biggest topic in, in this area is that the Affordable Care Act is being challenged in court and so there is a small chance that the Affordable Care Act could be struck down and while most advocates and we are very optimistic that that won't happen. Um, the, we're hearing that in October, the Supreme Court may start to hear um, this lawsuit that was put forth by um, several attorneys general from, um, I believe it was Texas and several other states. Um, but then also, we will probably not hear anything until next year when the Supreme Court makes a decision. So not until 2020. Um, so that is kind of flying in the air and but we remain focused on our policy priorities that we mentioned earlier. Um, but the Affordable Care Act is just one example of a group of um, a group of people that could be impacted by a major health care policy um, change. So if the Affordable Care Act goes away, it's kind of open up in the air as to how the health care system would react. Um, the other two pieces of coverage protections include Medicare and Medicaid. So in Medicare, um, there's, um, actually, let me touch on Medicaid first. So in Medicaid, there are um, these things called state waivers. So um, any state that operates their Medicaid program can submit a waiver to the federal government, to CMS, to try and make some changes to their program to best fit the needs of their state. Um, however, there are some alarming waivers that have been released over the past year or so um, that would create work requirements. Um, so people would have to report working hours um, or community engagement hours in order to qualify and keep their Medicaid coverage. So that's one example of a, um, a protection that we want to make sure um, remain, so making sure that people do have access to that Medicaid coverage and are not um, kicked off or, you know, um, that coverage remains while, while they need it. Um, and in Medicare, that kind of bleeds over into the drug pricing discussion. Um, I will say the one piece in Medicare that we're focused on is making sure that in the company insurance companies who offer Medicare Advantage plans, so that's the private um, plans offered through Medicare, that the insurance policies are person-centered, that they are not prohibitive or create too many barriers to access. So things like step therapy and prior authorization, we want to make sure that those um, policies are still um, flexible enough to account for people's personal preferences and goals. Um, 
and then, so in the drug pricing space, again, that has been um, in the news constantly over the past year, um, and there have been several bills or draft uh, p proposals that will address healthcare costs, but many of them are specifically focused on drug pricing. Um, and because we are, our organization is focused on total costs of care, this is, uh, drug pricing is not a specific area that we um, are super engaged in, but of course are finding those segues to then share with lawmakers what is important to people. So, um, and I think um, our other speakers can talk a little bit about where those um, proposals might be, but there's several that one would address surprise medical billing, and then others that are focused on lowering the out-of-pocket costs for Medicare beneficiaries in Medicare Part D, so putting a cap um, on drug costs in Medicare is one potential proposal that we've seen, um, and then others that look at um, potentially capping on a monthly basis versus an annual basis. Of course, we believe that a monthly cap would be the most helpful for people um, because you know, if you're looking at an um, annual cap of 3,000, you still have to hit that $3,000 mark. And some, many people are struggling with you know, like an $8 copay. It was the example from PAF that we've heard. Um, so there are a lot of proposals floating out there. One just dropped a few days ago um, from Senator Pelosi's office. So there are, um, you know, there are several different proposals that we're following, um, but it, it is uncertain where they will be at the end of the year. Um, and with that, I will pass it to Melissa, who will talk about surprise medical billing, which is our third kind of hot topic. Yes, so I already talked a little bit about surprise medical bills earlier, but to give you all an update of where things stand um, federally. Um, you know, this issue, I think, before I go into talking about the different proposals we're seeing, the issue of surprise medical bills, I think, is a very interesting one because it really grabs the attention of legislators when we saw so many stories um, published by Vox, Kaiser Health News, and NPR um, about people receiving these surprise medical bills that were hundreds, thousands of dollars. Um, and once the story became public, all of a sudden it went away. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I think it's just, it was just really interesting to see that, you know, this really grabbed um, a lot of uh, folks in Congress. It grabbed their attention um, because it really, this issue does really need um, a federal intervention. Um, a lot of states have passed comprehensive uh, solutions to address surprise medical bills. There are about 28 states to date that have passed um, legislation. Um, but there really needs to be a federal solution because um, the state legislation doesn't address those who are in ERISA plans. Um, currently, there are, I think there are about nine uh, proposals that we saw um, in Congress, both in the House and in Senate, or in the Senate that um, would um, address surprise medical bills. There are two that are particularly viable, um, at least we think, um, the Lower Health Care Cost Act, uh, which Nicole referred to. Um, it includes provisions around lowering out-of-pocket costs as well as drug pricing provisions, but it also includes um, provisions there that would address surprise medical bills. Um, and the Lower Health Care Cost Act um, was authored by uh, Senator Alexander, Sen uh, Senator Alexander and Murray uh, from the Senate Help Committee. Um, that's the legislation that Sheila was referring to earlier. Um, it did pass committee um, this past uh, summer, and so um, we're just seeing right now. We're just waiting and seeing what happens. Um, over on the House side, the Energy and Commerce Committee also passed legislation um, that would address surprise medical bills. It's called the No Surprises Act, um, and that's was authored by um, the, um, the chair of that committee, Pallone Pal and Walden. Um, and you know, surprise medical bills is just it has great bipartisan bicameral support, has the administration support. Um, you would think it'd be a home run, but we don't really feel confident that um, at this moment, I think, that there'll be uh, some movement. I 
Nicole just shared with me earlier today that there's um, a coalition of patient groups coming together who are saying, we need this issue to keep moving forward. We need a solution to surprise medical bills. Um, and you may be wondering why, why is it stagnating? What's, what's causing that? And it really all boils down to um, a payment issue. So if you hold patients harmless um, from sur surprise medical bills and you ban balance billing, um, how do the doctors get paid? Um, and so what we've been hearing is that physicians really tend to support this uh, arbitration, um, I guess, pathway to, to get paid, whereas um, some insurers and other stakeholders um, prefer a benchmark um, to, pay, um, to pay physicians. And so that's, we can't really come to an agreement. So, so the different proposals that we're seeing um, either follow a benchmark, um, there's also room for, there's some proposals that would address arbitration, uh, or not address arbitration, but would use arbitration as a solution for payment. Um, notably, that's uh, the Senator Cassidy uh, bill um, that proposes uh, that as a solution. Um, and it's, if you've been following this, like I have been in the States, it's been the same sort of thing. It's, it really does end up boiling down to this payment issue. Um, and we're seeing the same thing happen now in Congress. And I think what's most frustrating, at least for me as a patient advocate, is that it seems as though they're forgetting that the, the true people, the real people, who are affected by this issue, and that's the patients. Um, they're the ones that are getting the bills, and they're the ones who don't have a say. And um, at National Patient Advocate Foundation, we've long advocated for a solution to ending um, surprise medical bills um, in all care settings. Emer we talked about emergency, uh, getting a surprise medical bill when you go to an emergency room. Um, but you know, we wanted to apply both emergency and non-emergency settings. We want. Um, we want information to be transparent, um, to improve transparency. So again, that goes back to that cost of care conversations that need to happen, um, and help patients understand, you know, why, you know, what they can do so that this doesn't happen to them. Um, those have been like our core pillars in addressing this issue, and in many ways, I think we just need to remind um, Congress that this is. These are the people who are affected um, by surprise medical bills. It shouldn't, you know, go down this rabbit hole of payment. Um, you know, it's currently coming out of our pockets, um, and that's, you know, I think there's a better solution for that. So I will, I will end it there. Um, should I pass it to you, Rebecca? Before we hear from Paige uh, to talk about how she's been covering these and how your stories matter. I'll just underscore that the reason that we're not on the Hill beating back on the doors about these bills that we're talking about is there's no receptor site to hear about it right now. Um, right now the talk on the Hill is about impeachment <laughs> as of this week and other different issues. We really need to hone our stories and our message and that's what these few days are about and help Congress understand sort of name the problem, and Becky will talk about this as well, naming the problem from the perspectives of people, which is always the true north that's supposed to be the focus for all of the policies that we do. That gets lost in the shuffle of these partisan politics, as uh, I think Paige and Becky will both attest to from their different perspectives, but we really want to be effective and influential, and that means the community work that all of you are gonna be doing and we'll hear next from Paige from the journalistic point of view, what's happening and what matters most in the midst of this, it's really chaos <laughs> in a way. I, I think that's a fair, you might come up with a different adjective, Paige, but there's this chaos that we have to cut through. Um, and so it, it would be great to hear from her a bit about the specifics of what that can look like and what that means and how she filters the chaos when she sits at her desk to write those newsletters for us. Well, thanks, Rebecca, and thanks for, <clears throat> for having me. Um, it's great to speak to you all. 
So I came on board at the Post about two and a half years ago, specifically to launch Health 202. And our goal with the newsletter is to reach really anybody with, uh, with uh, an interest in healthcare. And so I try to write with policy people in mind uh, to sort of give them the nuggets and the tidbits that they're looking for, but then also just to the kind of the general audience to take these really complicated topics and legislation and all of this jargon and try to translate it for people. Um, so it, it actually has been quite the last few years. We launched the newsletter right in the middle of the 2017 fight to repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act, uh, which was great timing for me because there was a ton of interest in healthcare at the time. Um, I, I, there's a lot of things I could say. Um, I guess when you're thinking about the patient perspective, um, it's really easy for policy reporters in DC to just get kind of stuck in the policy world and not think about patients. You know, we're talking to the committees in the House and the Senate, and we're talking to lobbyists, and we're talking to industry groups, and we're trying to get the White House to talk to us at HHS, and in all of that and all of those moving parts, it's definitely, I, I feel for you, if you ever feel like it's hard to kind of get your voices through as a patient, um, I totally get why. Um, when I think about my own reporting, um, I have tried to incorporate incorporate the voices of patients when, I, when I'm able. Um, one newsletter or one addition that comes to mind is when um, back during the GOP effort to pass the tax reform at the end of 2017, there was a lot of conversation about getting rid of the orphan drug uh, tax break, which is a tax break for pharmaceutical companies that are developing medications that treat people with orphan diseases, which is, I think, uh, fewer than 200,000 patients um, to kind of give them incentive to invest in those kinds of medications. Um, and I'd heard about I'd heard about the thought that it might be repealed, but actually a friend of mine uh, who goes to my church and her son is the same age as my daughter, and he was born with cystic fibrosis. And she reached out to me and said, "Hey, have you paid attention to this effort?" We're, our family's watching this and they're part of um, some different organ patient organizations and they were really, really nervous that this was gonna happen um, because they're really hoping that eventually there might be a cure someday for their son, um, who was three at the time. And um, so, so anyway, she actually kind of inspired me to take to talk to people on the Hill and try to figure out what was going on and whether it might be included in the tax bill. And then I ended up writing a piece about it, and I quoted my friend in it and kind of talked a little bit about her experience as a patient. And I think um, just adding patient perspectives to the Health 202 makes it more readable for people, makes it more relatable for people, just kind of reminding people like, hey, when we're talking about the GOP repeal and replace bill that would change the way that Medicaid is structured, that actually has real ramifications for patients. Um, you see this a lot on the Hill. I mean, I think I think actually on the Hill, patients. I, I kind of feel bad sometimes, like for patients, because you know they just want to tell their stories, but they kind of get used by politicians as tools sometimes. I mean, you see all these highly politicized hearings on the Hill about Medicare for all or whatnot, uh, ACA repeal replace on the other side, and you have the Democrats find a patient that fits their you know their point and the Republicans, and they haul them up and. You know, at the end of the day, I think it does a disservice to the patient, although I guess it does give them a chance, of course, to tell their story. Um, I, I do think um, journalists have been really instrumental in, um, in, in exploring what the patient experience is like. Um, for a long time, the, the patient experience with using your health insurance and going to an out-of-network doctor or hospital there wasn't a lot known about that. I mean, everybody kind of knew that like they hated interacting with their insurance company and that this was a real problem, but it wasn't until journalists, I think, really started digging into this. Uh, my friend Sarah Cliff at Vox, I have a lot of respect for her. She since moved to the New York Times, but she has really pioneered this idea of collecting medical uh, bills from people who had been to emergency rooms and compiling this database and doing a series of podcasts and articles, really digging into the kind of bills that people were getting. And that was one of the big things, uh, like you alluded to, that really prompted lawmakers to start looking into this. Um, there's been similar reporting at Kaiser Health News, um, I know as well. So yeah, just a little shout out to my industry, I guess. I think I think we've done like a pretty good job um, in, in trying to highlight those stories. And of course, folks like you 
are, are really instrumental in that as well. Um, so anyway, I'll just leave it at there cause, there because I know we want to do Q and A. Um, or Becky, should I pass it to Becky? So. Hi, thank you. Um, thank you for the work that you do, and um, thank you on a personal level. Um, I've spent the afternoon here listening to your stories, and it's really sustained me in a personal way. About two weeks ago, my mom was diagnosed with uh, multiple myeloma, which is very treatable, um, but it's still scary as hell. So I want to thank particularly the patient advocates for your stories because it really meant a lot to me personally. So thank you for that and for your, for your work. Um, Rebecca asked me to talk to you about what you need to know about Capitol Hill. She indicated I spent over 20 plus years on the Hill, most of those working on the Senate Finance Committee. I was actively participating in pretty much every health care bill from 2003 to 2007. We worked, um, you know, we were part of the gang of seven that helped write the Affordable Care Act. I think one of the, the secrets about the Affordable Care Act is mostly Republicans helped write it. Um, <laughs> thems, are, thems are the facts. Um, so she asked me to sort of give you sort of what are the main things you need to know about working on Capitol Hill. And I've assembled four sort of just main things. And the first thing is nobody has a clue what's going on. When we were working on one bill, we, there was this famous little story. We went to, a, we had a staff party, and one of the little kids, he's like a four-year-old kid, did this little routine where he built up this little tower of blocks, and he goes, what's going to happen? I don't know. And then he'd whack the blocks all down, and they'd fall all over. So when we were discussing sort of strategy and everything, our little mantra was, what's going to happen? I don't know. <laughs> Um, but that doesn't mean you don't have to have a strategy. You just have to be aware that chaos theory prevails on the Hill, but you have to be positioned to take advantage for, you know, for the winds of change. The second is the, um, the complete animosity that exists between the House and the Senate. When I was interviewing for a job, I went to one of the House offices and there was a sign in the office, uh, it was a Democratic office, and the sign was, Republicans are the opposition, the Senate is the enemy. And that is, that is how it is viewed. I come from the Senate, so I'm kind of a Senate snob, so I kind of think it's mainly the House hating on the Senate and the Senate just kind of trying to do our best for the, uh, for the American people, um, you know, and the House being, being the House. But, you know, you need to understand that there's, you know, a dichotomy. Um, but things do come together. There is, you know, a mutual, mainly driven by a mutual interest to, to get things done, and then at the ultimate end to claim credit. You know, I've worked on, you know, so many bills when, you know, there was intense opposition, intense opposition, then it happened, and everybody took credit for it. So, you know, that's another thing you need to realize. The third thing you need to realize is the power of the personal story. Congress has a well-deserved reputation for being more unpopular than head lice and the band Nickelback, um, <laughs> which again is, is well-deserved. However, politicians, generally speaking, are actually fairly decent people. I mean, these are folks that really enjoy spending the entire month of August going from, you know, town halls to chicken dinners to fairs. So where they, the, the point is where they interact with folks, what, what means something to them is the personal story. Someone talk about, you know, data, yeah, you know, you need to assemble data, but don't discount the power of the personal story. Um, for me, that was brought really home when I worked for Senator Grassley, and there was an Iowa constituent named Dylan James, and Dylan James came into the office, and his family told the story about how they were having to turn down promotions so that they wouldn't lose eligibility for Dylan's Medicaid coverage because that was the only coverage that you know was keeping him you know who had a severe disability alive so that spurred Grassley to do the Family Opportunity Act you know which I helped him get over the finish line which provided wraparound coverage through Medicaid with folks with serious disabilities he worked on that bill for over 10 years and was driven by that story um, very compellingly Fourth thing you need to know is there's a group of, of analysts over in a, the bowels of the, of the 
annexed house office buildings. They work for the Congressional Budget Office. When I was in the, when I was in the Senate, I was taking my nephew and a bunch of his cousins around, and they're like, I want you to point out like really powerful people. And as they were sort of saying this, a really sort of disheveled guy with a bunch of big briefcases and a wrench coat was coming through the security. I'm like, that, that over there, that guy, is the most powerful man in DC and it was the it was the director of the congressional budget office the congressional budget office really sort of dictates what congress can and cannot do until of course Congress decides to ignore the Congressional Budget Office, which they, which they can and, and, and sometimes do do. But it's very important as we begin to think about this work, and Rebecca spoke about, you know, sort of needing to develop a strategy and think about a long game, you know, think about, you know, how we go and we educate through stories, and then we develop, you know, pr legislative priorities, and then we, you know, we sort of think about how to message that. Always there needs to be, you know, the issue of how CBO will view this. And I took away a very interesting nugget today, which I think, you know, which was really exciting, which is the fact that, and I hadn't known this before, due to increased costs, people will stop care. That has to have implications on costs moving forward. And if there's a way to sort of quantify that, that could be very, you know, that could be a very valuable um, data source moving forward. So I, I do have the unenviable position of being sort of the last speaker before I think there's a reception. <laughs> so I don't want to, I don't want to uh, overstate my goodwill here and I do want to hear from questions. So let's, let's hear from you. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Uh, just a, a couple of kickoff questions and then we do have time to turn it to all of you. But Paige, I will share the shout out that you offered. Um, the post masthead is democracy dies in darkness. And so too to, does the opportunity for us to keep health care at the top of the priority list. It was interesting in each of the presidential debates, first topic and lengthy topic, though repetitive, was health care. Um, how do we, when we're competing with all these other issues, what have you found, Paige, as most influential to sort of keep the attention on health issues? What is it that you think will grab people's interest as we look ahead? Well, I mean, I think that um, the Democrats are very aware that health care remains a huge concern for people. Um, lots of polls show that. Um, one thing that's kind of interesting, in, the way the, what they're talking about or what they've talked about in the debates doesn't always totally line up with what people are most worried about. So most of the conversation has been around achieving universal health coverage and closing the uninsured gap. And do you do that by incrementally, by putting a public option in the marketplaces, or do you do it with Medicare for all? And the debates have been surprisingly detailed and actually pretty good as far as like debates go in terms of the candidates actually kind of hashing through those differences. But um, what hasn't been talked about as much is just the existing problems with uh, health insurance, with, with private coverage now and employer-sponsored coverage and how costs are going up for for um, for those who are insured and premiums are going up, deductibles are going up. Kaiser uh, Family Foundation just released its latest annual poll on employer health plans today. Um, I was just looking through it before I came here, and like the average um, uh, cost for a family on employer-sponsored coverage is now twenty grand a year, and families pay on average six thousand of that, and then employers cover the rest. Deductibles are up. I mean, it's a crazy amount in the last, ever since 2000. Um, and that's been talked about a little bit less. You have seen uh, Senator Sanders and Senator Warren bring that up as they have tried to argue for Medicare for all. And Biden's been like, oh, Medicare for all is going to mean higher taxes. But then, you know, Sanders and Warren have come back with, well, we're going to be bring overall health care spending down. And, you know, you're trying to defend employer sponsored coverage. And there's all of these problems. People are already pretty discontent with the plans that they have. It's not like we're in this place where people like love their coverage necessarily. Um, I don't know if that really answers your question. But but I, I think definitely what people are 
what voters are most concerned about doesn't always align with what is being talked about by politicians. Um, yeah, I, I don't, I'm, I'm, I, I think you probably have more insight into actually how to get through to your members of Congress. Um, I do agree that I think personal stories really resonate with politicians. They tend to really be like people, people. I mean, they don't mind. You mentioned Grassley. I was actually, it's funny you mentioned him because I was just seeing, uh, I, I noticed he talked about how he has a tradition every August of visiting all 99 Iowa counties and he tweeted about it or something recently. And I remember thinking, that sounds like a terrible way to spend my August. <laughs> I'd rather go sit on a beach and have nobody bother me for a month. But but Sen the senator likes this, and he's like so. And you look at um, you saw this with President Trump. Actually, um, he was really gung ho on the right to try uh, legislation that was passed. I want to say a year and a half ago, and for whatever reason, that was like his is his thing. And I think it actually has to do. I did a piece on this um, around that time. Is there is a family? in Indiana who actually became good friends with Vice President Pence and their son has a really rare disease and they thought that this was gonna that he was gonna be helped by this right to try legislation and the family came out to DC and met with Pence and Pence introduced them to the president and that you could tell that I mean Trump tweeted about this multiple times he pushed for Congress to do this he even mentioned it in his State of the Union address um, and so I think that you shouldn't underestimate the power of your story if you're able to find a way to connect with um, uh, with a politician. Thank you. Becky, we um, have talked a lot strategically about, and the whole theme here is the bigger picture of costs of care, and drug pricing is the hot button issue now, but, now, but that's a, a kind of tiny sliver of the bigger cost of care issue. Can we make a segue to this bigger story by using our stories effectively on the Hill, do you think? Of course, of course. And it's as simple enough as making a distinction between the price of medication and the cost of care, which, as we know, includes all the social determinants of care, which include, you know, transportation, nutrition, emotional well being, you know, family support, family relationships, loneliness. Um, you know, there is, there is a natural pathway. But when you, you are talking about something that is not easily quantifiable, it takes a longer, there's a longer runway between like, oh, we can just fix it by, you know, allowing HHS to negotiate the price of 250 drugs. You know, that's, that's, a, that's a quantifiable solution. But when you're talking about sort of a changing a system of care and bringing in sort of qualitative, um, you know, approaches versus, you know, something that can be quantified, it needs to be thoughtful, it needs to be, you know, long term, it needs to be informed, it needs to be strategic. But it, it can be done. When I was on the Hill, I structured legislation around a certain group of foster care kids on the whole issue of normalcy. What is a normal experience, for example, when you're in foster care? And, you know, that took a while. It took a while to educate folks on the importance of normalcy and what that looked like. But it is, it is eminently doable to, to, to move the conversation away from the price of drugs to the cost of care, which includes the social determinants of care. On that optimistic note, let's turn to you for questions you may have of the panelists. Cynthia. Oh, wait, one second. I've been asked to make sure that we repeat the questions back with the microphones for purposes of the recording, so just make sure that we do that. Cynthia. Really a, something that's considered. 
Um, so I, I, I can't paraphrase all of that very thoughtful, but the, the issue was, is there attention paid to sort of the back end of care once, you know, front end is, is neglected? And what you, you know, what you have hit at, I, I talked about the, you know, the, the Congressional Budget Office. And one of the long-term battles that I engaged on, you know, in the, you know, in the health space was over the issue of prevention. Can, and I, I still believe, and, you know, we'll, we'll make it a cause of my life to convince the folks at CBO that if you can provide, and it, this goes exactly to your point, upfront preventative services, there can be savings on the back end. Right now, we've yet to crack that nut with them, but I think it's doable, and I think it needs to be a key part of this work we're doing moving forward. But then also comes into play when, uh, when it's not just preventative, but you have insurance companies that are, are nicking away at, at diagnostics. Exactly. And, and all the different types that they're, they're putting obstacles in front of patients all along the way, and how does that end up in the ultimate cost? Exactly. Exactly. I mean, that, that's, that was one of your points with, with Eric. If he had gotten an earlier diagnosis, there could have been more appropriate interventions, which maybe could have saved certainly a lot of emotional distress and potentially costs on the back end. Yeah, and I think in terms of uh, how we're thinking about this strategically for our agenda going forward, how can navigation services be appropriately recognized, validated as a cost-saving tool that helps patients and families, but also coordinating care across the health system. Because gosh, we already know that the appeals process and utilization practices don't work for people. They might work for the health system and insurance companies, though I think even the health system would disagree that the process works for them. It's costly for them as well. But how can we use navigation services, for example, as part of the solution without over-regulating insurance companies, but how can we then instead cut through that barrier and support what patients and families unmet needs are? I mean, that's exact, Rebecca is exactly right. The, you know, the Hill is going to be reluctant, particularly in the private insurance space, to put limits on their ability to control costs. That's just, that's a barrier we're going to have to deal with. But providing support for caregivers and for navigators to help patients work their way through the system is what, you know, could potentially be a toe in the door to sort of begin to make those changes. Other questions? So um, I've been in, in healthcare for 32 years, and um, and I've been a hospital administrator. So I understand a lot of what you you are talking about. Um, you alluded to the Affordable Care Act and and the changes that that are trying to come from that. Um, from a, a hospital standpoint, we there's there's a lot of information in the Affordable Care Act that affects the way we bill. And part of the purpose of the Affordable Care Act was to reduce the waste and inefficiency so it doesn't cost as much. <laughs> Needless to say, that didn't work. Uh, so um, is there any legislation pending, not necessarily about capping or insurance or any of those things, but on the provider side in terms of improving waste and inefficiency? I, I am not familiar with any piece of legislation that goes that goes to that. Um, you know, it's certainly you know it's certainly unfortunately because I, I hear what you're saying. Not one of the you know not one of the hot topics, but it should it it should be it absolutely should be. Um, you know, it's it's one of those things that probably would need to be folded into a larger legislative uh, you know agenda but it is definitely worth worthwhile as we move forward thinking about how you know to pay attention to costs and cost efficiencies how that could that could certainly factor factor in I know that um, this is something Senator Sanders has talked a lot about as he's advocated for Medicare for all and he's argued that um, his bill would like reduce um, waste in the system by like 15%, and that's probably on the high end because that's what you know he's trying to build support for his bill. But the estimates have ranged, I think, from like four, or five, six percent to like 15%. Um, but he's brought up he's brought this up a lot when uh, other Democrats have 
kind of criticized him about the overall cost of the legislation. We recently saw where the uh, medical system was suing their own, suing their employees uh, for medical cost. And one of the things that we just found out, the out some of the outcome was that some of those, I think it was like $68,000 had been uh, changed over from having these people that worked for them, employees that worked with them uh, and on their job and they were being sued and it was, it was co uh, court cost and all of that. My question is, we saw a lot of uh, what the journalism, journalism did uh, because that's what brought it open. But I wonder if we have, in, in that situation, I never heard anything say uh, that the government was uh, working with uh, the, the, those areas to take care of those costs. So how do we bring, and you know, you hear all of those splits on journalism and uh, legislators, but how do we bring it together so that we do have more positive results where you don't have people that make $12 an hour being sued by their own employees for uh, big bills. And I don't know if you all, if the, I, I know, I think the Washington Post had an article. I do know that uh, I, I happen to live in Memphis and one of the places was one of our big medical systems that was, they were char uh, having cost, co court costs and suing their employees that made $12 an hour for bills, hospital bills. Uh, that they had made. So I, I don't know if that's something that has, is a part, I know it's a part of cost of yeah, care. Yeah, I, I think I recall I, I, this, so she's, she's asking about, I think some stories that the Post ran, a series of stories maybe about hospitals trying to collect medical debt. I don't, I apologize, yeah. I don't remember the exact details, but but I, I think I do remember those stories and they were really interesting for sure. Um, I can only speak kind of broadly about medical debt uh, I've been thinking about it this week because you, not to always bring up Senator Sanders, but he proposed a plan to wipe out $81 billion in medical debt. Uh, he proposed that over the weekend. And uh, I, I spent a little bit of time looking at, into his proposal. I mean, he's certainly right that medical debt is a huge, huge problem. It was the leading cause of bankruptcy before the Affordable Care Act was passed, and it's still the leading cause of bankruptcy. Um, or... or medical bills, but then also the loss of income. So those two things combined, um, not necessarily just the medical bills, but, um, but, uh, but, but it, it's, it's not as simple as what, what the Senator is proposing because what he's proposing to do is um, basically look at the medical debt that is reported to private credit rating, rating agencies and then try to buy that debt um, but I spoke with um, actually someone who runs a charity that buys medical debt, and they were saying logistically that's really hard because you don't necessarily know which hospitals are holding that debt. And also when you're thinking about buying medical debt, I mean, people people go into debt for a number of reasons. Maybe they do have more means, but they decided not to buy health insurance. Maybe they did buy health insurance, but it was one of these lean plans that don't cover stuff and they didn't realize it. You know, maybe they, so it's kind of a whole range of things. And if you, if you want to go after, if you want to help people that need the most help, you presumably would want to find the accounts at the hospitals that are, you know, where, where the people that owed are, are of, of lower income perhaps or have filed for bankruptcy already. So anyway, all that to say, it's a huge problem for sure to your point, um, but I don't know that I've really seen any like workable proposal to kind of fix the problem other than sort of the obvious, which is to just help people get coverage and make sure that it's more comprehensive. happening and so once it came out then people started I mean Twitter and all the social media some of the things that they said that that made a difference even talking about the uh, hospitals uh, having their employees go into court so many times having to leave work catch a bus or get catch a ride to, in order to answer to a, a lawsuit about a bill that for in a place that they worked so I, I really think, and when I say that, I say that because I think that so many times just that, that one sentence, that one question, uh, that one statement is just, 
the catalyst to get things going? It's a good question for the town halls that will be coming up. Yeah. Melissa, you want to talk about the medical debt legislation briefly? Yes, yes, um, thank you. Um, I mentioned this on the webinar, but if you um, have been following or have been with us for uh, some time, you know that we have uh, really championed uh, a piece of legislation called the Medical Debt Relief Act. Um, and we've been following it for a couple years now, but it has been reintroduced this year by Senator Merkley. Um, the legislation would make it so that any medical debt um, that has been, I guess, corrected or paid for um, would be removed from your credit report so it wouldn't be this negative ding um, that so many patients always complain about. You have to wait the seven years for uh, medical debt to be cleared out. Um, this would make it so that once it's, um, once it's been taken care of, um, it would not be part of your credit anymore. And also in instances when you receive a medical bill, um, it would give, um, I think it would think about a year or so it w until it will be posted onto your credit report, um, which would give patients um, and case managers um, time to either rectify um, bills if there are problems, because we know there are a lot of problems with medical billing, um, but also give patients an opportunity to figure out a payment plan or, um, you know, something so that, you know, it won't be... Uh, it won't be something that negatively impacts them. Um, and there's also a companion uh, legislation for it in the House um, that has been introduced by Representative Tlaib um, that's part of a larger um, debt package um, for uh, consumers. But um, it is something that we've been following. Um, and yeah, I think that's, yeah, if you have any other questions, I'll be happy to answer Tiny band-aids on the bigger problem that you've identified that is part of what we need to share. As, you know, what Paige said about the amount of bankruptcy that happens as a result of health care costs and lost income, which isn't talked about in the context of drug pricing, right? We're, we're never even looking at these total costs of care, which is a theme of us these few days, and the theme of us and our advocacy how do we take the opportunity to really share these bigger stories? And you highlight a very important element of what total costs of care mean uh, for the future. And if we can use surprise billing and the buzz that's been built around that, that started with a lot of, I, I think it was indeed a Band-Aid story that really kind of, yeah. that Sarah had printed, that really it was like, you know, the bill for that um, was out, just outrageous you build that buzz by naming these problems and putting stories behind them. There's one of my favorite sayings is every story is statistic with the tears wiped away, or every statistic, I guess, is the story with the tears wiped away. And that's what we all up represent is the stories that coupled with those, these data will really make an influential case. I think we can take one last question, if there are any, otherwise I want, yes. Um, you talked about the CBO earlier, um, and and then earlier today, somebody also alluded to the fact that data speaks loudly, right? So um, if if we collectively or as part of our community project or anything like that wanted to work with the CBO to try to to quantify various things, then is that something that somebody could just like make a call and make that happen? I mean, how does that work? Could you walk us through like how does the CBO sure. even get to the place where they do that? Sure. Thank you. That's a, that's that's a really good that's a really good question. The the question I was sort of how do you get to you know to to, to CBO? Um, you know there are there are lots of ways to do it. You can you know you can send it you can send it to Rebecca who can send it to me. Uh, you know I I know you know I, I know the people at CBO. I worked I worked with them. You know I I cracked their code. One of the things that you know I always did. You know, CBO, like kind of like the you know the, the 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 House hates the Senate. The thing that unifies them both is sort of hatred of the CBO. Um, <laughs> it, it just it's a Washington a common enemy. Thing, you know, <laughs> it it is. You know, you can it takes a million years to get a score out of them. They won't tell you a lot of times what their assumptions are. You know, it's just you if you listen to C-SPAN, you know everybody rails on you know on CBO. But I always had a really good relationship with them because I really did respect the work that they did. You know, they could be infuriating 
And, you know, you would come in and you'd be like, surely this would produce savings. You know, I came to them with something that I just, I was convinced was going to save, you know, you know, billions of dollars. It ended up costing, you know, in their mind, billions of dollars. But, you know, you always, I was always very respectful and very friendly. So I have good relationships with them. You can establish relationships with the committee staff who work, you know, you know, in complete tandem with them. I mean, one of the things that I hadn't realized when I moved from the personal office to the committee office was how closely you work with, with CBO. When you are working on legislation, you are talking to the Congressional Budget Office every single day. So if you develop a champion in one of the, you know, ideally one of the committee staff office or one of the committee members offices, then you can, you know, you can parlay that information through congressional office, through, you know, through an outside, you know, advocate um, to, to inform their decision. And they really are thoughtful people. They really do want to know. And they are kind of working, you know, in isolation over in the Ford building, you know. And so it is, it is helpful. And I was actually, I actually did that on the Hill through the through the Family Opportunity Act. We we had this really big score initially when we started on the Family Opportunity Act, and I reached out to a lot of states and got a lot of state data that demonstrated that what some of these families were doing to manage these costs was to put their kids into foster care, where they would receive Medicaid, um, you know, services, and it was it was it was substantial. And by showing that, giving that data to CBO, they, they actually reduce the cost of the bill. So it's possible there are pathways, and you know we can we can work with you to get that. But I think that's an excellent idea. That state level data is and will be critical. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Please join me in thanking our panel. Thank you.